Hi, and welcome to the video tutorial series that will hopefully assist you in mastering ARM microcontroller programming with the bare chip. I want to thank you for the responses from the previous video in the comments. They really helped motivate me to make more of these videos. I was very surprised and heartened to see that I was able to make some level of impact with the lives of a lot of people professionally. That really does pump me up to make more videos and I'm so excited to, to, to keep going with this. In this video, I'm going to show you how to set up the physical environment for these projects so you can be successful in making these projects. The physical environment is set up pretty much the same way that it is in the previous video series, but um, I want to go over it again, but also uh, offer some alternatives that you can use to set up the environment. We're starting with the LQ FP64 microcontroller package. This package is low profile quad flat pack. It's low profile, it's, it's very thin. There's also the thin, the TQFP, and then there's also QFP, which is not as thin or not as low profile. The quad has pins on all four sides, and there are 64 pins. Obviously, we can't prototype in its current form because this is an SMT, it's a surface mount product. We need to break it out into some kind of PCB like this. There are alternative PCBs. This is the one that I sell on newbiehack.com. The reason why I broke it out in this way is because I'm using three breadboards. This particular breadboard only has 30 tie strips on one side. 30 plus 30 is 60, and I needed to break out the other four pins. So what I did is I designed it so it would plug in like this. One on each side, and then another one on the bottom here. And you can position this pretty much anywhere you wish to gain more real estate on one of the sides. There are alternatives that have 32 pins on each side. So you can use a breadboard that looks like this that has many tie strips on the breadboard. Any of these alternatives that I talk about, I'll have links in the description so you can just go right there and, and purchase it. So in the case of that alternative, you can plug in two of these boards like this. You don't actually have to use a 64 pin a microcontroller. You can use other packages. You'll just have to find the breakout that's necessary for that particular microcontroller. It doesn't really matter which STM32 microcontroller you use. There's going to be some differences with the um, data sheets and the, and the reference manual, but since I go over all of the features in the data sheets and reference manual, you'll know exactly where to go to make any changes necessary. This is another one that I, um, I'm gonna put on the website if you wanna purchase this one. This is a 48 pin breakout. The device that allows you to connect the computer to the STM32 microcontroller is the programmer. The programmer looks like this and it allows you to send the programs that you create to the microcontroller. The programmer also allows you to connect the microcontroller to the STM Studio to monitor the variables that you wish, to graph the variables that you wish, and also to debug the program while it's running. ST also make a programmer like this you can purchase if you're looking for something that is directly from ST Micro. Other components that you'll probably need, maybe not in the beginning, but other than the breadboards and the microcontroller and the breakout, you'll need hookup wire like this. This is solid core 22 gauge hookup wire that you'll use to connect from tie strip to tie strip uh, to connect certain components to the microcontroller. I use LEDs for output for certain circumstances to maybe test a pin or uh, signify maybe an air condition. So you'll need some LEDs. You'll also need a lot of resistors of different values. And I suggest getting a set that has already a lot of values in it. Resistors are one of the passive components that, you, that you'll use in most projects. You'll also need capacitors of various types. I would get uh, a whole set of capacitors if you can, but these are generally used for filtering on signal lines. Uh, these are especially important. I'll have the links in the description of what you'll need. These are particularly important for the power lines of the microcontroller, and you'll have larger ones that you'll need for uh, more power supply related. You'll need input devices like 
push buttons. I don't use too many other input devices other than push buttons and maybe potentiometers to serve as an input, as an analog input to test the ADC. I may from time to time connect a battery as the power source and I love these uh, Mac 604 and 603 chips because they are low dropout voltage regulators. They are great to use for battery power supplies because you don't have to have a battery that is much higher in voltage than what the, the circuit requires. My first project I'm going to be doing is the UART or USART communications protocol and I'm going to be using a Dynamixel servo and controlling a Dynamixel servo and also receiving information from the Dynamixel servo. This project will be half duplex and I'll explain all of that in the video and all of the other features that you uh, need to know to communicate using the USART and UART communications protocol. This is one of the least expensive servos that Dynamixel creates, but it's still rather expensive. So you don't have to use a digital servo. You can use any device that uses the UART communications protocol. You'll just have to pay special attention to the data sheet that comes with that particular device so you can properly communicate with it. And I'll show you how to determine if you're communicating to it properly and how to test to see that the program is actually working and, and is communicating. In the videos themselves, I'll be showing what devices and products you'll also need to help you test and understand what's going on with the circuit. You'll notice that I used the LCD quite a bit in the previous video series, but that took up a lot of real estate on these breadboards. The only time I'll be using the LCD in the future projects that I do in this video series is when I don't want to be tethered to a computer to get information. Instead of using the LCD in these projects, I'll most likely be using the STM Studio to get information from what's going on in the well, market controller. So like if I want to know what a particular variable is doing, let's say I have um, a temperature that I want to be looking at or even um, a data register that is giving me the result from an analog to digital converter, I can look at that information right in the STM Studio. I can see the results. I can um, see what any variable that I create and maybe in the conversion I'm wanting to convert from, let's say, uh, the digital number that's created from the analog to digital conversion into an actual temperature when it, where I'm using a slope intercept formula um, that you've seen me use in the past and it's also detailed very well in the book. The, the STM Studio will be the way I look at that information. In the next video, I'm going to talk about the software side of things. So we'll install the, the STM32 Cube IDE and also install the STM Studio. Maybe take a look at some variables. Uh, we'll do maybe a timer uh, in the beginning because we have to use a timer in the UART project. And we'll see some of those variables counting up or and we'll see some of those videos in the program on the STM Studio and uh, I'll show you how to uh, look at those variables and being able to peer into the program while it's running. I want to give you a little bit of background on my programming ability. I started programming when I was uh, really young. I was born in 1968 and I started programming in 1970, 1979 or 1980. But the programming language that I used was BASIC because I started with the TRS-80 uh, by Tandy Radioshack. Uh, I also used a little bit of um, assembly language. And soon after, I was able to get, I think it was a 286 or a 386. I think it was a 286 or it was probably even an 8086. I was able to upgrade to an 8086 or a 286. I can't remember which one. I was able to get into the C programming language at that point. But I learned programming on my own. I learned from just reading books in the library at that time. I didn't really get that much of a formal education. My programming ability, for the most part, is mediocre at best. I'm more familiar with programming with the C Sharp environment rather than the C++ and the C environment. But I do have knowledge of C and C++ because of the videos that I've made and some programming I've done in the past. With that said, you should have no problem following along with the programming that I'm showing on, these, on this tutorial series. 
for the more experienced programmers out there, uh, I would love to see any improvements in the comments of those specific project uh, tutorial videos. That will help new users, new to coding, or even uh, intermediate, or even some maybe advanced coders learn some better techniques that I may not be able to show. All of my previous videos that I did for the STM32 from the beginning will work in the STM32 Cube IDE. And I'll probably go over um, maybe a couple of the differences or things that you need to watch out for, which are mainly just the include statement because in the, S uh, the STM32 Cube IDE, the only real difference is the main include is the, uh, the pound include main.h. And the main.h has all of the other includes that, that is needed for understanding the, the code that I used in the previous series. After I upload um, each project, I'm going to have a live stream right after that project to discuss any specifics or any questions that you guys may have with the project. While it's fresh in my mind and as a courtesy to the viewers that are so dedicated to watch my videos uh, right when they come out, you get the opportunity to be a part of these live streams to uh, ask the questions that I hopefully can answer and maybe even others that are joining in can help answering and also uh, joining in in the discussion. I hope to see you in the next video. Thank you very much.